Hi, I'm Randy Harry, one of the pastors privileged to serve here at Providence United Methodist Church, and I'm so glad that you've decided to join us for worship here in the net, our contemporary worship service. Of course, we are in person on, at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, but uh, I'm so very glad that you can join us whenever you might be watching this video. By the way, we also offer an 8.30 in-person service here at the church on Sunday mornings. It's in our chapel. It's a very casual, very brief service, and we always serve Holy Communion there. So if that appeals to you, I encourage you to stop by for that service as well. But again, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. I hope it's going to be a great blessing for you. Hi, I'm Randy Harry, one of the pastors privileged to serve here at Providence United Methodist Church, and I'm so glad that you've decided to join us for worship here in the net, our contemporary worship service. Of course, we are in person on, at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, but uh, I'm so very glad that you can join us whenever you might be watching this video. By the way, we also offer an 8.30 in-person service here at the church on Sunday mornings. It's in our chapel. It's a very casual, very brief service, and we always serve Holy Communion there. So if that appeals to you, I encourage you to stop by for that service as well. But again, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. I hope it's going to be a great blessing for you.
church say Amen. let the church say Amen. hallelujah you know every now and then uh, well let me say this is a new song that we're going to sing and it's uh, it's a really beautiful song and it just talks about our relationship so feel free just to, to listen sing along if you know it The 
It's called Love Note. I said dog days of Lent. Doesn't it feel like that? It's like, gosh, I got two more weeks of this. But the exciting thing is, is we gather on Sundays because we look at Sundays as little Easter's all year long, whether in the middle of Lent or not. So this is still a day that we can rejoice and celebrate in the great salvation that is through Jesus Christ. I wanted to share with you as we continue with worship uh, a way for you to stay connected with us. If you have signed in at the back, that's great. We also have a digital way of signing in, especially for those of you who are joining us from home. You'll see here a QR code or you can just text the word welcome to 704 
476-1938. I say that every week. I should have it memorized. Uh, you'll re after you text the word welcome to that number, you'll get a text back with a little link on it. Click the link, put in your name and phone number, and then that way we'll know that you've joined with us today. So, um, so please do that. I uh, want to remind you also uh, that uh, today is Communion Sunday, uh, and we have an opportunity that we haven't had since the beginning of COVID. We are going to receive communion from the communion table here at the front. So when you're instructed later on in the service, you'll be invited to come forward. You'll have an option of a couple of different ways to receive communion uh, here at the communion table and then return to your seats. So we're really excited to be able to uh, come around the table again, not just uh, in our heads, but literally as well. I wanna remind us of the God that we worship today. Um, we use symbols to do this, and, and we also have uh, sacred symbol kits, these little gold boxes there at the back that you can have your own sacred symbol kit that you can uh, follow along with us here in the service, or you can take home with you if you ever need to worship online. You can set up your own sacred symbol space. And we use symbols to remind us of the God that we worship. We use the symbol of a globe to remind us that God is the creator. Uh, God was pre-existent and God exists forever and ever. This is the God that we worship. We also worship God the Son. His name is Jesus. And he lived on this earth, who died on the cross and was resurrected so that we might live eternally with God forever and ever. This is the God that we worship. And this Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit, whom we represent as a dove that is with us in presence all the time, constantly reminding us and constantly guiding us along the right path if we would listen. This is the God that we've gathered here to worship today. Would you pray with me? So Holy God, Creator, Son, Holy Spirit, would you descend on this place once again? Would you make yourself as real and as present as the person sitting right next to us? Would you make yourself known? For Lord, we live in a world where it can be easy for us to lose faith and lose trust that you are still there, that you are still good. But Lord, would you come with us today? Inspire us, uplift us, encourage us through this music and through this word, through your story, through your son. Lord, we are here today because of you. And we're here to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we pray that you would surround those issues in our world from wars in Ukraine to the people who are hungry and starving in different parts of the world, people who are facing natural disasters of storms and tornadoes, people who are looking for food and, and employment, people who are, feel alone at this time. Lord, may we, the church, be your extension into this world. Would you call us once again to be your hands and feet to a world that needs encouragement and reminders that you are still God and you are still good. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to serve you. So inspire us now to go from this place to love and serve in representing as ambassadors of you and your son, Jesus Christ. And all of this, Lord, I pray in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share with you a few of the exciting things that have been going on and will be going on in the church. Uh, this past week, we had our first uh, uh, church-wide, post-COVID church-wide dinner. For those of you all that could be there, I heard it was really, really good. Uh, I came down with a, a little cold and I couldn't, I couldn't come. But I saw the pictures and it looked like it was a lot of fun. So I can't wait for the next one, which I believe we're planning another one coming up pretty soon. So be looking out uh, for that. Uh, today is Mission Sunday for the Dove's Nest. We are focusing on uh, the Charlotte Rescue Mission. It's an addiction recovery program, a free addiction recovery program here in Charlotte. And Dove's Nest is the women's extension of that. And we have a team of people who are putting together uh, an Easter extravaganza for them, and they need your help. So sometime this morning, 
uh, between Sunday school or if your Sunday school class wants to come down, go into the atrium and help them put together these Easter eggs and these baskets for their uh, Easter extravaganza that they're doing. It's a way for you to serve meaningfully right here through our church this morning. So that's today. And our focus being on Charlotte Rescue Mission doesn't end with just today. We're issuing a challenge that all of us get to know Charlotte Rescue Mission a little bit better by doing one thing. Would you be willing to go out to a coffee? Would you be willing to go out to a lunch or to a breakfast? Charlotte Rescue Mission sponsors Community Matters Cafe, which is a uh, uh, which is on their campus, which is a way for them to... Um, to employ and train uh, the people in the addiction recovery program as they transition back out into the real world. So every time you go there, every dollar that you spend, every time that you're a part of what they're doing, you are helping that mission make a difference in somebody's lives. So would you take a chance to go up there and do that? Take a selfie of yourself and send it in to us. That would be really a, a fun way for us to share the joy of all that. Uh, also, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, where we are experiencing the Palm Passion uh, story of Christ in the service. This is going to be a very special and creative service right here. We're going to have a Palm Parade with the children here. We're going to tell the story of Jesus' last week through a lot of different media. Next Sunday is going to be really exciting in all our services. I hope that you will be a part of that with us. And then, of course, the following Sunday all of this is in preparation for Resurrection Sunday, which we call Easter. So at this time, I encourage you to consider getting involved in this congregation in one way or another. Consider supporting the ministries of this church through your tithes and through your offerings. You can give online. You can give in our basket at the back. But would you consider supporting the ministries of this church?
never good at this, am I? All right, today's scripture, it comes from uh, the prophet Isaiah. Um, and that we come at a time in the scripture where the prophet Isaiah is speaking to, the, to his uh, friends, I guess, in exile. They have been in exile for so long, declaring finally the day of the Lord coming to save them, the promise, Jesus to fulfill the promise of the impending salvation for them to return to the homeland. So we're going to read Isaiah 43, starting at verse 16. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. So do not remember the former thing. Or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello, church. Good to see you today. And good to see our middle schoolers who, who had lock-in this weekend. I hope you had a great time. I hope you're not too exhausted, but thanks for being here today. It's awesome to see you all. And for those who are joining us online, I'm Randy Harry, one of the pastors privileged to serve this wonderful congregation, and I'm so glad that you're part of this service too. I hope that you'll feel connected with us today and moved as we all hope that we're moved by God through God's Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So my daughter, Wren, has always loved to dance from a really young age. She was dancing formally, I think, as kindergarten on. And when she was much younger, she participated in community children's theater and uh, among other things that she used to do. And one of my favorite productions, stage productions, that she was involved in was Annie. She played one of the five children who danced and sang, which meant she got to use all of her performance skills all at once, and it was, it was a great time. I can still remember so wonderfully that uh, the, the, the number, uh, it's the hard knock life, when the girls were singing and dancing and joyously just having a grand old time. It's just a great memory. Of course, one of the most well-known songs from Annie is the, uh, the one sung by the eponymous character Annie, right? The, the sun will come out tomorrow, bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there will be sun. And, and then it closes with tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you tomorrow, you're always a day away. And you all are thinking, please stop singing, Randy. <laughs> this is a song of hope, right? It's a song of hope. In the face of tremendous obstacles, Annie still has hope that tomorrow will bring something new and that her unfortunate circumstances will change for the better. Hope is a universal and timeless yearning, a belief that tomorrow can somehow be better. It's something the people of Ukraine are holding on to right now, even though they're watching their fellow countrymen die and their nation's infrastructure destroyed by the invading Russians. Hope springs eternal. A well-known phrase first uttered by the English poet and essayist Alexander Pope in the early 18th century would seem to affirm what I just said. Hope springs eternal. But just clinging to hope, though, isn't always the easiest thing to do, is it? When we face one struggle after another, year after year, COVID gave us a little taste of that. We all talk about COVID fatigue, right? After two years of this, we're worn out by it. But that doesn't really compare to what the people of Israel were dealing with after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians 600 years before Christ. A remnant of Judah's 
citizens was carried away to Babylon where they remained in exile until the Persians conquered the Babylonians in 539 BC. Utterly defeated physically, emotionally, and spiritually, the, the Israelites despaired over the loss of their homeland, the loss of their capital, and the loss of their temple. They struggled to understand how and why it had happened, although prophets like Isaiah provided clarifying pronouncements pointing the finger at the people in their waywardness as the primary cause. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah contain many proclamations of judgment, including against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And the chosen people came to understand that the destruction of Jerusalem was the result of God's judgment against them. I mean, how else could they explain why this had happened? They experienced a crisis of faith in trying to make sense of it all. Something shifts in Isaiah, however, beginning with chapter 40. The change in tone is so dramatic that biblical scholars often refer to as chapters 40 through 66, the rest of the book, as Deutero-Isaiah or second Isaiah. It's that much of a shift. And suddenly words of healing are spoken by the prophet as the focus turns to the time after the conquest of Judah and after the conquest of Babylon by the Persian king Cyrus. Hear these words that open chapter 40. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid. Restoration rather than judgment is the message with which this section opens and continues. And then in chapter 43, where we find our scripture for today, another crisis point in the history of the Israelite people is recalled. But that one too ended in salvation and with salvation. God, through the prophet, remembers from the, the time when the people crossed safely through the Red Sea, escaping from the pursuing Egyptians. God delivered the chosen people then. God didn't abandon them in Egypt, but instead heard their cries for help and rescued them through Moses. Water is a significant feature there, but note that water, there, there's a reversal in the role of water from that story to the story that we look at today. Because you see, in the time of the, prom, the time of the Exodus, water was a barrier that was keeping the people from getting away from the Egyptians. And so they saw that barrier as possibly leading to their death. But now its absence would likely be a cause of death as the people hope to return to the promised land. And to do so, they have to pass through the dry wilderness. So God in Deutero Isaiah says that he is about to do a new thing and that he will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God then reaffirms that there will be water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to God's chosen people. All of this is to say that once again, God has not abandoned the chosen people and that God will lead them back to the promised land. God is about to do a new thing that will bring refreshing springs of hope where it had all but dried up before. God is going to restore the nation to life. Just as God parted the Red Sea and rescued the people from Egypt, God is going to perform another miracle and, going, and, and is going to give life-giving water to drink where there usually is little or none. This likely is meant literally as well as metaphorically. God is a God of hope. God did a new thing as recorded in the Hebrew scriptures from today. As we see in the New Testament, God also did a new thing in Jesus Christ. The other day, I felt led to pull off the shelf my copy of Philip Yancey's book, The Jesus I Never Knew. In a chapter entitled Mission, A Revolution of Grace, Yancey speaks of a number of instances when Jesus reversed the rules of his day and time. And I see these as examples of doing a new thing. Yancey points out that Jesus was the friend of sinners. Now, I don't think we get the shock of that just from the perspective of the religious leaders back then. Good, in quote, Jews were, supposed, were not supposed to be, keep company with sinners. Jesus 
and Jews rather, were set apart by God, especially Jewish teachers, rabbis such as Jesus. And yet not only did Jesus hang around with such undesirables as defined by the Pharisee standards, but he even ate with them. And that once again was this big affront to the religious leaders because it broke all these table fellowship rules. But Jesus didn't seem to care. He was doing a new thing. Jesus also ate with tax collectors. They were despised. They were despised by the people as traitors because they were working for Rome and also because they were seen as thieves because they could line their pockets with whatever they wanted when they were collecting taxes. They could raise your taxes to put more money in their own pockets. They were hated. And not only did Jesus dine with them, but he actually invited one of them to become a disciple of his. I'd say that's doing a new thing as well. There were specific rules against touching unclean things and people. And yet again, Jesus didn't hesitate to touch even lepers, even lepers in order to heal them. And he healed persons whenever they came to him, even when it was on a Sabbath. He was more concerned about making people whole than he was about the strict letter of the law, at least as interpreted by the Pharisees, a new thing. Women in the first century were second-class citizens. They were separated from the men in worship and in public rarely would talk to a man who, were, who a man was not a member of their own family. It was looked down upon. Jesus, however, had all sorts of encounters with women that ran contrary to such mores. He talked openly with the Samaritan woman at the well. A woman who had lived a sinful life anointed his feet with her tears and with perfume as he ate dinner with a Pharisee, according to the Gospel of Luke. Jesus spoke with her directly. They weren't related. Spoke with her directly and forgave her of her sins, gave her hope. Women were apparently among his extended group of disciples helping to care for him. Uh, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke point all of that out. Jesus treated women with a remarkable, and in those days, a surprising degree of equality and respect. He was doing a new thing. Philip Yancey says this, in short, Jesus moved the emphasis from God's holiness exclusive to God's mercy inclusive. Instead of the message, no undesirables allowed, he proclaimed in God's kingdom, there are no undesirables. By going out of his way to meet with the Gentiles, eat with sinners and touch the sick, he extended the realm of God's mercy. I'd say he was doing a new thing and thus, he gave hope to the hopeless. He gave them living water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The question I have is whether God is still doing a new thing. And if so, how? My quick answer to both of those is yes and us. Yes and us. Thursday evening, I attended a webinar sponsored by the Lake Institute on Faith and Giving featuring PBS NewsHour commentator David Brooks and his wife, Ann Snyder. It was a wonderful webinar, but some of the stuff they said was challenging. Ann Snyder is a Christian, and she asked the question, where is the church in regard to the many challenges we face today? But then she gave this litany of one after another example of how churches, local churches, and nonprofits who are affiliated with churches are making amazing impacts across our country. Well, I'd say that this church is present as well and all the wonderful things that this church has been doing. We just celebrated Room in the Inn Wednesday evening. Praise the Lord for that amazing ministry. Pastor Brandon talked about uh, Dove's Nest and, and, and the Charlotte Rescue Mission. Looking out at Denny Hammock and, and What's Next Ministry and the ways that has impacted all these ministries that this church has done. So I'd say, praise the Lord, we've been present. But what new thing might we do? David Brooks, who is one of my favorite TV analysts and writers because of his level-headed and intelligent approach to complex issues, spoke of the increased hostility and lack of empathy today and their effect on social interaction. Brooks is Jewish by birth, but he's become a Christian. And he said that instead of seeing the line between good and evil running down every human heart, we now tend to see it running between us and others. Everything is becoming politicized these days, but it's not politics in the usual sense of issues of economic distribution. Instead, it's identity politics. 
and it's at the heart. And at its heart is not seeing others and feeling unseen ourselves. We have an epidemic of social blindness, he said. And the result is the harsh way we communicate toward one another. So what can we do? Among other things, David Brooks says, we as children of God should treat others as though they have a soul too. <laughs> we should love them in other words. Now that should sound familiar to us as followers of Jesus. And as a means of really seeing other persons, he says we should hone our conversation skills. Now think about that. We should hone our conversation skills, engaging with others in meaningful ways that communicate with them that we do see and hear them. Brooks even spoke about the importance of asking open-ended questions. This may sound simplistic and naive, but Jesus' restatement of the entire law as loving God and loving our neighbors was concise too, but it was profound. It was profound. What if we were intentional as Christians, especially as Christians of this church in engaging with others, including others who don't share our political and other views in respectful and meaningful conversation that shows our genuine care for them? What if we talked with them in a way that communicated that we care? Just that simple act alone can transform our relationship by showing others that we see them, that we hear them, that they matter to us as fellow children of God. Given the current poor state of communication in our country and the world, transforming our conversation along these lines may very well be doing a new thing. That's just a simple way, but it can have a big impact, I believe. I'm gonna wrap this up by saying this. I do believe that God is still doing a new thing each and every day. I also believe that one of the main ways God does so is through the body of Christ. You and I as Christians, as the body of Christ, are the channels through which God is doing a new thing. And so let us constantly keep our eyes open for ways that we can take part in God's great adventure of doing a new thing. You and I are called to be givers of hope to carry water into the wilderness of despair and frustration and fear and aggression. The weary world is parched, but we have living water to satisfy its thirst. God is doing a new thing and invites us to participate. May it be so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It's been two years since we've been able to celebrate Holy Communion in the way that we used to, two years. Today we're doing a new thing in relation to that as compared to what we've been doing. But it's still a little different from the way we used to do it. So I've gotta go over some ground rules. First of all, for those of you who are watching by a live stream right now, I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, if you'll grab some bread and, and a cup with juice and set that as your holy space, you can participate as well, and I hope that you will. For those who are in the room here, here's what we're going to do today. And we're giving you options, so you have to pay attention to this. If you are at a point where you're comfortable the way we've been doing it, using these small, what I always refer to as chalices, the little plastic cups, then we have these up here for you when you come forward. But if, on the other hand, you feel comfortable and you'd like to receive bread and a cup in, in that form that we used to use in, in the church, um, then we're going to offer that to you. We're going to offer you the bread, and then you'll go to Brandon for the cup. So the way we'll do it in this room is I'm facing a, a, an aisle here, and this is where we're going to invite everybody to come down this aisle, no matter where you're seated. If you're seated here, you come straight in. If you're seated over here, if you'll just kind of loop around. But everybody, if you'll come down this aisle to receive when it's time and then cross over. And if when you get to me and you don't want the bread, if you'll just sort of 
put your hands up like that, across that kind of thing, and move on. We'll hand that to you and make sure you've got that as an option. You also have a third option, just to make it further complicated. If you're not comfortable receiving one of these cups, but you want the bread, you can do that as well. Just point when you get to Reverend Brandon, and he'll, he'll accommodate that. So we're not taking by intinction. I just want to make that clear. We're not dipping the bread in the cup. That's the difference as a compromise. That's probably the longest explanation I've ever had to give for Holy Communion. <laughs> but it's been two years. <laughs> So let us, let us center our hearts and our minds now to receive. Gracious God, we confess that we are not the people that you want us to be, that we have let you down, that we have let ourselves down through our sinfulness. We say this so that we open our hearts to you, O oh God, and that you will touch our hearts and heal them today. We're sorry for the ways in which we have not loved you with our heart, all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the ways we've not loved our neighbors as ourselves, the ways we've not talked nicely to those fellow children of God or shown them that we care. So God, we pray for your healing this day, and we thank you for this holy meal. Oh, Lord, we thank you. All this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So on, on that night in which he was betrayed, Jesus gathered his disciples at the table. It was Passover week. And he did something very special. He took bread and he showed them, the, he took the bread, he gave it, gave thanks to God. And then he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, take, eat this is my body, which is broken and given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup when the supper was over. He took the cup, he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus wants us to remember. He wants us to remember that he died, he's risen, and he will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your Spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All this we pray in the blessed name of Jesus who taught us to pray as we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ. And it was broken for you and for me. And the cup of salvation, the blood of Christ shed that we might have life. I invite you now to come forward as you feel led. And as I said, to remind you to come here. And for those at home, I invite you to receive the bread, the body of Christ broken for you, and to receive the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you.